All right, what's up? Happy holidays. We are here. And uh, I didn't realize it until maybe just like half an hour ago, but this is going to be the last stream of 2022. So, because uh, I am visiting family next week, so next Monday, so I will not be streaming next Monday, but happy holidays. So, I think with the season, it's probably going to be kind of a quieter night, uh, and it might. It might literally just be me tonight, which is okay. It's actually, um, it's a pretty chill vibe right now, so. But I do hope we have some people joining us. Uh, I, I really hope Roy Roy comes back, because we are listening to his pick last week. Uh, we got some Sonic, Sonic music, specifically from Sonic Fan. Please like and subscribe, because that's actually a pretty cool... Uh, collection it actually has a pretty cool lo-fi mix so um i'm really enjoying it but anyway tonight we're going to be talking about the atlantic sharp nose shark rise of Pyrandon terra novi which is like the probably the most successful it's kind of hard to define these terms like successful but probably the most successful shark or the fittest shark if you will um kind of in this day and age you know in terms of just intense fishing pressure and habitat loss. Uh, this shark is handling a lot of that pressure really, really well because it is very uh, fast growing um, and is very uh, quick to reproduce. And if I remember correctly, I believe Atlantic sharp nose sharks reproduce uh, every year, um, like, 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 which is pretty fast compared to most sharks. Most sharks are a year and a half or two years or they even have like a three year reproduction cycle. Uh, but Atlantic sharp nose sharks, uh, reproduce yearly so they're um and oh by the way we're not watching them right now <laughs> um these are sand tiger sharks uh on the screen so it's just that um it's hard to find yeah merry oh merry christmas oh my gosh yeah that's hilarious like i i didn't i did not vet this video before so i didn't realize it was also a christmas video that's hilarious Anyway, um, so the channel that we're watching right now, uh, it's actually, it does have a little bit of sharp nose shark footage, but there's really not a lot to uh, dive into, so I just kind of slap this on in the background as we get started. So, but if you are new to this uh, whole little live stream, I hope you have something cool to drink. I have made a little bit of hot cocoa for the season, so I hope you guys have a cup of cocoa as well, or uh, just like a cool pastry or whatever you whatever you need uh as you do whatever you're doing tonight whether that's studying yourself or um like working on a project or uh actually like i don't know about you but like during the holidays like i love um tinkering with things or like messing with like like, like building things or puzzles or just tinkering with things i think one of my favorite holiday projects was like i hacked my 3ds <laughs> a couple of years ago <laughs> to uh to play certain games that are not available but i'm not gonna say which games because i don't i really don't want to get in trouble but anyway so let's see i think it actually might just be me tonight which is totally totally cool so this is a good shark to talk about on like a chill christmas winter night um because like it's it's adorable it's small it's ubiquitous uh it's 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 a very common shark in uh the atlantic or at least the uh, the American Atlantic or the North American Atlantic, but it's not very popular in the zeitgeist. So, and let, let's go ahead and switch videos because I can't talk about sand tiger. I can't talk about sharp nose sharks with sand tigers on in the background. So let's go back to the only video of this shark on YouTube that shows it in its natural habitat. That's the only one we got. Only one we got. Which, it's, it, it might be a little bit, like, blurry, but it works. You, you could tell it's that shark. So, this is provided by Cape Fear Shark Cam uh, Fishes. Cape, uh, Cape Fear Shark Cam Fishes. Oh, let me, like, go ahead and like that. Hey, yo, I'm signed in. Come on, I'm signed in. Oh, my gosh. Let me switch screens as this is happening. Oh, dude, actually, am I really... Oh, I don't want to give you guys my email. Oh. Okay, well, that's the end of that. <laughs> All right, sorry. I love you guys, but I can't. I can't give you my email. So um, anyway, all right. Well, that was it. That was the one video we had on that shark. So, um, but 
What's kind of fun about the species, this is the first shark I ever handled. Uh, so I dug this up. This is from 2012, so that's like 10 years ago. Yeah, literally a decade ago. That's wild to think about. But this was uh, on the RV Bay Eagle, which is part of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science uh, fleet. Uh, and this is part of their shark research survey. So I um, did like a trip out there. I forget what time of year. I mean, this was summer, but I forget exactly when in the summer. But we went out of Vims and through, uh, I guess, like the mouth of the York River into the Chesapeake Bay, north-ish towards the mouth of Mobjack Bay, going into the heart of the bay, the head of the bay, and then around the mouth of the bay where the bridge tunnel, we could definitely see the bridge tunnel in sight. So we were kind of in that central area where these sharks are really populous. Um, and like this is a very, it's, it's weird, like officially, uh, they're not really described as a common species in the bay, but again, they're ubiquitous all around the coast. So I think they're pretty common and they're definitely the shark that we caught the most on that day. So, um, and we had a, we had a couple sandbar sharks too, and we actually got a butterfly ray. So, and when I say caught, I mean catch and release, not 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 capture or take or, or anything like that. Um, so, what these surveys do is we mimic uh, what a commercial long line um, emulates, like like kind of how like commercial fishing goes, and like we measure how many sharks that we can catch and. Um, you know, we, we, we take some essential data like their length or um, weight, or uh, we even give them tags uh, in some cases. Uh, this shark right here has a tag, um, and it's like kind of near the, oh, what's the word, the origin of the first dorsal fin. So it's that little yellow red thing that you can see. And that's not a satellite tag or anything. That's more like a, um, I forget you call them spot tags. Ooh, what kind of tag is that? But it has, it has data on it where that if somebody is fishing and they actually catch this guy, no, nope, screw it, I don't know. Um, if somebody's fishing and they actually catch this individual, they'll be able to report it. And that kind of helps uh, scientists like um, BIM scientists to track maybe where the shark goes. So, um, which is pretty cool. But one big thing, oh, somebody is here. Is this, is this, is this the legend, Royal Roy? What's up? Or whoever you are, thank you for jumping on um i was just talking about this is a uh picture from like 10 years ago <laughs> um this is the first shark uh tonight's shark we're talking about is the first shark I ever held is a uh, sharp nose shark uh atlantic sharp nose shark so um but like what's kind of fun is this is the first shark that i, I learned how to handle small sharks with where and it, it seems kind of counterintuitive but you actually have to the proper way to handle it is you actually have to put your thumbs Oh, hey, Howard, what's up? How are you doing? Like, I, I really, really appreciate uh, y your comment on the Snaggletooth shark video. That was super cool. Like, are you, do you, do you research that species or like, if you, if you don't mind me asking, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I just, I, I really, really appreciated your comments from the last stream. So, and also if you don't mind me asking, where, where are you, um, where are you from? Cause uh, I'm like, uh, for, guests on the stream like uh or people on the stream um I, I i love kind of you know seeing like where they are in the ocean and then i'm also kind of keeping track of like countries and stuff so but I'm, I'm just kind of curious but and also i'm just gonna take a sip of my cocoa but welcome to to tonight's um study party so uh what was i saying about these guys um and if there's like a delay in my response, it's it's just like the internet and stuff. So, um, like like I apologize in advance if if I just like barrel onto a topic and if, if you type something and it seems like there's a delay. But anyway, um, but with this shark, this was the first shark that um, I ever like the first small shark I ever worked with, and I learned that apparently that um, the proper way to hold them is you actually have to put your thumbs underneath the jaw, like like underneath like the lower jaw. Oh, cool. Sorry, I just saw your comment. Yes, I in assembly research collection. Oh, cool, cool. Hey, what's up? Awesome. Another go Canada, man. Canada, Canada and and this stream, I, like we're going strong. So, that's awesome. So, welcome. Um that is really cool. So, for uh relatives of the Hemis, um is it is this like Hemigalia day in general or um and like do you, do you work with like 
uh, fossil sharks as well as living sharks. Um, I, I'd, I'd be really curious because um, I didn't realize that. I, and I think I mentioned it on the last stream, like Hemipristis, I, I knew that there was an ex extant species, but I didn't know there was just one. And then I didn't realize that the most famous, I, I, would, I would argue that maybe the most famous Hemipristis is, is the prehistoric one, like Hemipristis sera, because of all the, the teeth. So, um, so I, I learned a lot on that stream. It was really, really cool. And actually, honestly, these, these whole, all these live streams, like they're super freeform. So even though tonight's shark is like the shark no shark uh anything you want to share about like hemis like like kind of christus please please feel free to add it in the chat because like like i i always love learning more about any kind of shark so please please feel free like like, like it's 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 just a super 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 free form so so um sharks are like pure muscle like like that thing even though it's like a small little guy like the, he's almost like the size of like my my family's dog like it's t powerful like i had to really wrestle with it so um let me catch up on thanks uh chiogalius hemigalius and paragalius as well as all the hemipristis awesome that is super cool i know five associated dent whoa whoa five associated dentitions for uh, H. Sarah, that is super cool. Um, so actually, I do have a question about. So, for associated dentitions, are these like, are, are these like collection, like fossil collections of like, like one species, or or are, th are these dentitions like subgroups of H. Sarah? I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, um, like for example, I'm trying to think of like, um, like you know, like uh, for. Tyrannosaur, like, like, for, like, I, I think for T. Rex or not T. Rex, but like Tyrannosaurus, like, you can find different skeletons, and they're part of, or maybe it is T. Rex, like they're part of T. Rex, like, the species complex, but it actually could be like a couple species within that complex. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, actually, yeah, I'm gonna shut up. Yeah, just, just, uh, what are associated dentitions for H. Sarah? Are they like, like? complete jaw sets for one individual or are they like um different types or different morphologies within the species or, or that grouping if that makes sense I, i'm really curious about that let me look up i've got um i don't know if you've seen this sharks of the world uh by ebert nando and fowler this is like Probably the greatest. Ooh, an associate dentition includes the remains of one individual organism. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Um, th th thank you for answering that, by the way. Uh, I, pre I appreciate that because, like, cool. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Chiogelius, Hemigelius, and Paragelius. Because I know Paragelius is still extant. Gotcha. Right. The past one in your live stream. Right, so like the one from Maryland, um, like, uh, or or I guess like the complete jaw set where it's like you have like you you're like looking at the complete picture, as far as an associated dentition, that's super cool. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on Hemigalia Day now. This is, excuse me, it's it's clearly it's a group I don't know um, that well, so, because we. I don't think we have any hemigaliids in like the Western Atlantic. Oh, here we go. I'm just scrolling back up to your genera. Hemigalias. The hook tooth shark. Ooh, that's cool. 
Actually, you know what? Wait. The Gibson specimen is probably the most complete specimen, but fortunately it's in a private collection. Yeah, like, like, um, gotcha. Yeah, it was like, like, I, I remember talking with Roy Roy last week. Uh, we were, we were both like, it, it should be in a museum. <laughs> like, um, you know, it, it's, it's like, cause like something that rare, I mean, or, or that complete, it's, it's like, I, I understand why somebody wants to keep it, but at the same time, it's like, it's, it's so rare. It's like, it kind of should be for the public. I, I mean, you know, it's my opinion, but like, um, by the way, oh, awesome, yeah, thank you. Like, by the way, uh, part of these live streams is the viewer, ideally the viewers pick the sharks. So each week we do um, a new shark and like each week we do uh, new music. So, and if, if like nobody is like, it, it, like if it's a quiet night or if like nobody is um, like an agreement, then I'll just go ahead and arbitrarily pick whatever. But um, you have you can pick next or not next week because uh, it's we're not gonna have a stream next week. But for the uh, January um, when, when we come back to this, uh, you can pick the shark for uh, like the uh, our next stream. So which I think is like January second, January first. Um, but you're more than welcome to pick the shark if if you want to do um, another uh, Hemigaliad or uh, or whatever uh, shark you want, as well as like study music. Because uh, we, we're listening to Roy's Choice right now with uh, the Sonic. So, um, let's see. Let me get out of this photo, by the way, because I think I said everything I needed to say about that whole story. Um, let's see. And actually, I'm kind of curious, for sharp nose sharks, There, I, I remember there's like a lot of cool studies with this species. So, um what I'm checking out right now is sharkreferences.com, which I don't think... I might have jumped here last week, but um, I don't remember anything of note because we were, we, were we were mostly on the fossil website, fossilguy.com, which is awesome. So, But uh, sharkreferences.com is an awesome resource for um, really any species, both extinct and extant species. Um, and it's like a... Coming out of Hornsby Island... There's some interesting shark fossils coming out of Hornby Island, British Columbia. Ooh, wait, let me, let's check that out. I'm curious. Uh, probably, let's try fossil hunters because it sounds like a person who collects. Uh, I am super curious. Hornby Island fossil collecting. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, this is probably not going to be what I want. Um, are there any... Uh, I, can't, I, I don't want to see teeth for sale. Oh, sorry. A shark fauna from the companion of Hornby Island. Oh, there we go. This is like a paper. Ooh, 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 this is cool. Okay. All right, so a, sh a shark fauna from the Companion of Hornby Island, British Columbia, Canada, an insight into the diversity of Cretaceous deepwater assemblages by uh, Henry or Henri uh, Capetta, Kurt Morrison, and uh, Sylvain Adnet. So let's see. Uh, this article describes a rich and diversified elasmobranch fauna collected from the Upper Companion Northumberland Formation, a part of the Nanaimo Group, uh, exposed to Hornby Island, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, also, random question: uh, Howard, do you like Nanaimo bars? Because like I discovered those a year ago, and they're the best freaking thing I've ever tasted. Like they're they're delicious. Like like random question, but go Nanaimo for inventing the Nanaimo bar. It is probably the greatest dessert alive. So. Um, all right, this fauna consists of 30 species belonging to 26 gen genera and is uh, characterized by a large number of new uh, elasmobranch ta taxa, 17 species, 7 genera, and 2 families. All these principally belong to the usual deep water squalomorphs. That's cool. Um, I really love that terminology, use usual deep water squalomorphs, because um, and we, talked about, we were talking about piked dogfish, squalus acanthias, a couple streams ago. And um, I think I mentioned how weird it is that Squalus acanthias is a shallow water shark because that group tends to be like deep water. So Squalus acanthias is kind of like 
an anomaly. And I guess Squalus succlei as well. They're both kind of like like the Pacific spiny dogfish and the pike dogfish. They're both kind of anomalies in the Squalomorph group. So that's super cool. Um, Clematisolatiforms, Hexantiforms, Echinorhinoforms, Squaliforms, Pristioforiforms. Uh, this last ring association displays two striking features. No Batoy taxa have been found, despite the extremely fine process of collection, and is mainly composed of taxa living in a deep water environment. The identified species have a large panel of body size, estimated between about 50 centimeters. Ooh, wait. Yup. Wait. <laughs> now that looks like a lantern shark, but that, I don't know if that's a typo or if that's like an actual genus. Aot Mopterus? Is that a real thing? Let's check this. Uh, actually, yeah. Wait. Uh, we'll do extinct all. I mean, I guess I could search for it, but I kind of like going through the bar here. What is this called again? Nope. Ah. I, that feels like a typo. Is that a real... Do you know if that's a real... Genera? Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, I just saw your comment about, about your grandmother and Nima bars. Dude, that's that's awesome. Like, like I, I literally... Like, I grew up... How old am I? I'm like 30 now. And, like, I discovered this t two years ago. A year ago or two years ago. I, I've missed out. They're just... They're amazing. They're so good. Um, do you know... Uh, do you, Howard, do you know of Aopt, uh, is this real? Am I, am I, I'm gonna, I'm checking the list right now, but is that a real fossil genus? It just looks so weird. E-O. No way, that's for real, what? Well, this is real. What is this? All right, I'm, I might put a pin in that. We, we might have to come back to this, these, some of these references. We actually, no, uh, I think I can get a, a file on this, right? Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just kind of bouncing around really quickly. That's part of the fun of this whole project, by the way. Like, uh, it's completely random. Like, I don't, I don't have, like, a lecture or anything. It's just, like, it's whatever we can find whenever. Um, okay. Let's see, three to four meters long. Zamplodon, uh, Zamplo, Z Zampylodon, sorry, Zampylodon, there we go. Novel genus and Carcarius, and maybe more for Dicaeus. So I don't know this genus, I don't know Zampylodon, and I don't know Dicaeus. Do you know, do you know these species? Um, like, uh, please let me know if you do, because like, those are those are new. I'm not I'm not as good. I'm I'm okay. Well, actually, no. I'm. Let's just say an amateur at fossil, uh, East Coast American sharks. Like I I get the gist of many of our species, but I'm still like an amateur in in terms of fossil sharks. Um, for for the, like the American East Coast, and then anywhere else, I have no idea. I don't know who's who and and what's what. And I I I, I really I should learn like and i hope kind of through these streams we do learn more because it's like where i learn more like <laughs> we're no, we all learn more because that like fossil sharks is something i definitely want to i definitely want to brush up on because it's so cool like I, I know like general biodiversity patterns but like um that's still a field i i, I like shark paleontology that's still a field like i i could grow a lot in so uh hornby island fauna represents by far the most diverse deep water assemblage ever described in the late Cretaceous. That is awesome. Particularly rich in hexantiforms and squaliforms, providing new insights in the history of the deep water settlement of this period. So, oh. Oh, can we get into this? Sorry, I got so excited about this that... Full article, let's see. Can, is this gonna show the full article? Ah, uh, shoot. Okay. Yeah, darn it. Okay, there, there's a paywall. Darn it. Uh, let's try the Dewey, just in case. So, um, 
I don't have a lot of rules on the stream, but one is I can't I can't do I can't get it if I can't if it's something that has like a paywall um, or we have to pay for it I can't stream that I can't broadcast that, um, it just because it's like that would be it, I don't know what the right word is I, I I guess it's sort of I don't think it's illegal but like it's like it's not good like because like it's not like you know like. Most of the research references, and I think a lot of the references on sharkreferences.com are publicly available, so I'm cool with like checking those out. But if, like if it's like a paywall, it's like eh, that that would not be good. If I like paid for it and broadcasted to everybody, that would not be good. So, nah, no bueno. But let's check out, um, and I'm just kind of going back and forth between comments. Ooh. Uh, Hexantius, is that H Hexantius Microdon, or, or is that Heptrank? My, uh, let's see. I just saw your comment about fossils. Microdon. That's a. Uh, because we have Hexantius Grisius, Hexantius Notorancus, if I'm remembering that correctly. So Microdon's ancient. Unless it's, unless I'm totally getting the uh, genus. Oh, Hexantius, awesome. All right, super cool. Um, actually, that's really cool. Like, uh, is, are those? Would that be kind of like uh, the tooth shape is like? It's like you have the root, and then you have like three crowns. I, am I remembering like a single tooth for that species has like multiple crowns in a row? Um, I wonder if we could find an example of that here. Uh, microdon. There we go. Oh, perfect! <laughs> oh, look at that! All right, boom! Awesome. All right, so that's super cool. I got the number wrong. I got the concept right, but I got the number wrong. One, two, three, four, five. And, it, and 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 I know that that could probably depend on like where in the mouth like like that's super cool though wow that's really cool oh look at this look at all these oh shoot I'm I, oh my god it's freaking out okay sorry about that this one's from Germany Poland. Whoa, whoa! That is really cool. Uh, look at the look at the serrations on that. Like you have these, that is an extremely cool tooth because you have these serrations at the front, and then damn, multiple cuts. So, uh, whoa, <laughs> that is so cool. I just saw, I just saw you have uh, your your tooth has uh, four cusps. That's awesome. That is super cool. Um, I'm curious why. It evolved that way. I, I I would imagine. I guess it's like, it's basic. I, I would imagine it's it's, it's kind of like um, a saw blade because I know these sharks, like the living species, um, they eat a lot of anything. But like whale falls are, are like a thing where it's like you know it, it has to have like that kind of tube type to cut through blubber um, and like they they'll go through that like after a whale fall like like the like Hexantius like living Hexantius. So. Um, so I guess, I guess the reason they have that tooth type is to be like a saw blade, you know, kind of like um, to, to tear through that. Um, is my guess. I'm not, not 100% sure. But this is interesting because, like, um, these teeth right here, that's more like kind of like fish teeth, you know, like like as in like hooking um, kind of grasping teeth. This is like a saw, 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 te saw teeth and these individual ones with, like, the long points, it's like... Um, it's like a fish hook. Like I always think of sand tiger teeth when I see teeth like that, um, and like sand tigers are mostly piscivorous, um, as far as I know. Like, um, like the the long needly teeth are great for ensnaring fish. So this this is super cool. Awesome. Yeah, I like I didn't know for the longest time how big these guys get because it's like they could be like fourteen feet. 20 feet even? Let me, let's see, let's see. Um, 
Oh, that should be easy. These are always in the beginning of the book. Uh, Oh, shoot. D damn it, stupid. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, I forgot. So, all science is correctly on the metric system, and I am a goofball from the goofball country who uses whatever we use. Oh, gosh. Okay. I have to convert. I don't know why length gets me. So, um, hold on. Hexanthus Gracius is what I always think of. <sighs> this is so bad. So, they, they get to be three meters, possibly four meters. Um, and then in feet, that is, this is so bad. I don't know why. I love metric mass. I don't, I don't know why I can't do metric length in my head. It's bizarre. Um, meters to feet. Okay, yeah, so in feet, it's like, maximum size is like 13 feet. Average size is about 10 feet. Still, it's a big, big animal. That's awesome. Okay, enough of that, let's keep looking. Oh, I think, oh no, this is a different, same site, but this is a different tooth. And actually, before we get too far in a rabbit hole, let's go back to, because you mentioned a fossil, uh, a fossil site in British Columbia, British Columbia, Hornby Island. So let's go back to that. Um, okay, I don't want to do tea for sale. I think that is the same thing. Uh, birth point. Um, hmm. Dinosaur home. That sounds pretty good. No? Is this another blog? This might be another blog. Okay. No, I don't, I don't really want to blog. Okay, I don't really want to blog. Hmm. Um. Do you have, do you have any uh, recommendations for resources? For, like, um, like, because I'm, I'm really curious about, ooh, fossil spot. Uh, let's see. I'm really curious about uh, research coming out of this area. Um, and so if, if you have any recommendations for a website or resource, uh, uh, please please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, let's see if we can find Hornby. There we go. All right, Hornby Island. Uh, we got some... Genera, but I actually don't know if any of these are sharks. Hmm. Am I looking at the right US Canadian fossil sites? Okay. No, oh, just three? Okay. Let's go back here. This might be possibly interesting, but that's also not public. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> BCfossils.ca. That might work. Oh, there we go. There we. Uh, well, no, we don't want a crab. Shark fauna. This is this is the one that we can't get into. It was super cool, but we can't get into it. But you know what we can do? That I'm kind of curious about now, is they did give us the genera. So we talked about. We talked about. Uh, we did talk about Aeo. Uh, oh my gosh! How in the world do you say that? Because I took Latin. Ao, Ao it, wait, Ao at Mopteris. 
Ao Edmopterus. That that is a horrible. Ao Edmopterus. Okay, Ao Edmopterus. So that's how you say it, but it's a horrible, horrible, horrible name. Um, but we talked about that. I don't think we had anything in sharkreferences.com, but let's look at Zempylodon. I'm kind of curious about what that looks like. Oh, there you go. Zempylodon dentatus. And, ooh, look at that. What in the world kind of shark is this? Hexantriform Hexantridae. Oh my god. All right, so we got we got a lot of these guys. That is super cool. So, and actually this is extremely cool because this so that means so so good pick by the way because that means like in this assemblage we're seeing like Hexantridae and genera that are no longer um that, that, that are no longer here anymore because, like, Hexantias today are just Hexantius and Heptranchius. And I... Th and one more. There's one more. Um, Notor or something. Maybe that is... Maybe I got the names mixed up. Um, but Zampylodon it, it does not exist anymore. So this is actually really cool because I, you know, like... Because I, I, I work with and study, like, mostly, like, you know, living sharks. So I'm used to Hexantridae and Hexantriforms being a very um, uh, not specious group, like a very like light group as far as biodiversity goes. And it's really cool to see like ancient species, like like more biodiversity, like like through fossil species. Um, that is super super cool. Notorhynchus, that's the one I was thinking of. So I got I, I got some names mixed up. So the living Hexantrids are Notorhynchus, Hexantius, and Heptranchius, and that's it. So just three genera, but this one is ancient. This one uh, does not live anymore. Uh, so this that's super, super cool. Lake Cretaceous. Good pick. This is really cool. Uh, where? Hornby Island. I'm kind of curious where this is, actually. Uh, I just want to zoom out once it loads. I don't want to crash my internet. Hornby Island. Oh, cool. The famous Nanaimo. Okay. So that's actually really cool. I had a friend who kayaked around this area, and she says it's amazing because she lives in, near Seattle, but um, she kayaked around this area for orca whales and had an amazing time here. I think there's a whale center near here, actually. But that is really cool. So that is actually really cool. So that this area used to be uh, deep water habitat that accommodated these deep water... Um, uh, hexantians. That is extremely cool. Wow. All right, go. Shout out to Hornby Island. This is super, super cool. Oh, wow. And these are uh, research references to this species. Lake Cretaceous of Antarctica. Wow. Wow. That is actually awesome. So this guy who's been found in Hornby Island has also been found in Antarctica. It might not be, um, do they have a note on this? Wait a minute. The identified species of large panel body size estimated between about blah. E.g. Is that for example Zampylodon, or is that saying that we found Zampylodon? No, no, yeah, it is saying we found Zampylodon. I'm sorry, it's Monday. Yeah, because this was collected from Hornby Island. Okay, anyway, sorry, so the point being, that's actually really awesome. So this species was found on Hornby Island, and it's also found in Antarctica, because, like, there's research references about, that include Zampylus, or Zampylodon in Antarctica. That is extremely cool. So, ooh. 
Um, it would be extremely interesting to have a stream on shark trace fossils like corpolites, bones with evidence of shark predation. Ooh. So, yeah. Do you know, um, so I do want to do a species focus each stream, but I am open to fossil species. So do you, do you have a recommendation on, like, a fossil species that has, um, that, that kind of fossil? Like, are there, are there famous species that have, like, that are associated with trace fossils or like evidence of predation because I, I i'd be totally down to do like like a stream it's it's sort of devoted to that species but like we we can always branch out um as we as we're doing right now because <laughs> tonight is like the shark no shark stream and we're we're completely different which is totally which is totally fine because it's like um i think in the first episode i ever did i talked about i don't know if you've ever seen the show adventure time but like adventure time is hilarious and it's like a lot of the episodes they start out with a mission and they never get to it because they go on an adventure so um that's kind of like uh that's kind of like my idea for these shark live streams where we're starting out with atlantic shark no shark but we, we're we're going on this really cool adventure with uh these fossil sharks but but anyway i do want to do like each episode has a different species so if you have any recommendations on a a fossil shark that maybe is known for or or has famous uh examples of like trace fossils i i totally be down to do that like i I'd totally be down to do an episode for that so um let's see because off the top of my head again i'm not i'm not really great with fossil sharks so um i don't know what species would have that but let's see discover the most ancient nodidon tooth in late Jurassic New Zealand. Okay, I'm just kind of curious about what this is. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm. This is just selfish, selfish curiosity. So here we go. Discovery of the most ancient uh, noted Danodon tooth, Neosalachi. Hexantiform forms in the late Jurassic New Zealand. New considerations on the systematics and range of the genus. Uh, Henry Capetta and Jack Grant Mackey. So, very cool. Uh, this paper describes the first Hexantia tooth from the late Tithonian of New Zealand. Uh, for the moment, this tooth represents the earliest representative of the fossil genus Notodanodon. I have no idea. Uh, have you heard of Notodanodon? Because um, that one's new to me. In the world and one of the most ancient Neoslachians in the southern hemisphere, despite the perfect state of preservation of the unique tooth, the species is left in open nomenclature, pending discovery of additional specimens. A few nominal species have been assigned to the genus Notodanodon. From the four from Cretaceous deposits, uh, and Antarcti, Notodanodon tentatus, Notodanodon lanceolatus, Notodanodon pectinatus, and only two from the Paleocene. Notodanodon Bratensi and Notodanodon Luzi. Alright, so, okay, do you know what? Uh, I'm going to. This is my New Year's resolution. So, you see where this stupid Santa <laughs> shark thing is? I am actually going to put. My New Year's resolution is I'm going to make a geologic time bar here in this part of the the, the display. In, like, the. the, the do you call it a HUD heads up display? I'm gonna make a geologic time scale bar here because I do need like like there's so many different periods and I always get like Pleistocene and Pliocene or Pliocene and Miocene. I always get their order mixed up. So I'm gonna make a geologic time scale. Uh, that's my New Year's resolution for the next stream, is to make a time scale um, on the left bar. So so that when we go through these time periods in in the literature, I know what in the world, where in the world we are. So. But actually, that that'd be really great to um, that would be really great for just like uh, just as like a anchor point for navigating fossil shark science in general. So I'm gonna do that. So that is my New Year's resolution. So considering the important morphological variations observed between some of these species, it seems obvious that the genus Notodanodon is not monophyletic and will need a revision in the future. So I'm kind of curious about... Uh, can we not do this? Can we not get in here? Do we? Ugh. Ugh. 
Why isn't knowledge available? Uh, okay. Well, cool abstract. What I did notice here is Notodanodon dentatus, Zampylodon dentatus. So I'm kind of curious, and they said, like, um, species revision. I'm kind of curious if uh, maybe they're the same shark with different names. Um, that has happened so many times in history. Like, oh my god, I don't, you don't even know how many times. Like, um, even fairly recently. Actually, so one thing that happened really, really recently is um, Carcarius, which is a genus that is kind of, I mean, sort of notorious for a uh, Revision. Didn't, is that happened recently? So sand tiger sharks, Carcarius. I think they actually had a revision recently. That blew my mind. Right. Okay. All right. So here we go. So uh, sand tiger shark, Carcarius taurus, recently has been revised, or I don't know if it's proposed or if this is like confirmed, to Carcaridae. So it's base it's its own family, which is wild because it used to be considered <clears throat> part of the family Odontaspididae, which is the deep sea sand tiger sharks now. So these are like the small tooth sand tiger, big eye sand tiger. Um, I always grew up thinking there were three sand tiger sharks in one family, and then now they said, oh by the way, the sand tiger shark Carcharis taurus is its own thing. It, it's it's kind of like a basking shark. So like. It's its own family. It's it's its own one species, uh, in like like or it's a family of one species. So super cool revision. Um, it is not new to that species in particular. That shark has been called Odontaspis taurus. Um, oh god, it's got a lot of names actually. Let's go check that out really quick because I'm really curious about that. And then I'm going to meander back to the shark no shark <laughs> in a little bit. I want to, I want to give some shout out to, to our shark no shark friend, but, um, where are, wait, did I, did I click Xander extinct? Extant valid. Sorry. Hmm. There we go. Carcaris Taurus. I know. There we go. Okay. Lamna. This is the big one I was thinking of. Okay. Eugomphidus. Eugomphidus Taurus. That was the big one that it used to be called. Uh... Of course, it was called Squalus at one point. So just in general, like, so many sharks throughout the ages of classification get reassigned and reclassified, and um, it gets better and better. Like, like they get more and more accurate, theoretically. Well, actually, no, not theoretically. I, I think they do get more and more accurate as classification goes onward. But it's just really funny seeing, like, a lot of the ancient names, um, or not ancient names, but, like, older names for the same shark and just how often it's been revised. Um, so, and it's kind of fun, like, some sharks have been, or are, like, so old that they've been classified, I don't know if they were classified by, um, Linnaeus himself, uh, but they were definitely classified around the time that he created our modern system of classification. Like, um, Car is it Carl Linnaeus? I should know that, because <laughs> that's like basic biology. Um, Linnaean classification, who invented that again? It's, it's Linnaeus, but I, I forget what's his name. It is Carl, that's hilarious, he's a Carl. Okay, Carl Linnaeus, so. And I'm pretty sure the white shark was classified as by Linnaeus, so, um, ooh, hold on. And I swear, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to the shark, my shark, I promise. Car Carodon, Carcarius. Uh, 
Yeah, that's taking too long. Uh, let's just go through the list. So many Carcarinus. Uh, wait, am I am I not spelling right? <laughs> Hold on. Uh, control find. All right. Carcarodon. Am I going crazy? Come on, show me, show me my shark. There we go. It is Linnaeus. Okay, cool. All right, awesome. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I was nerding out for a bit. Um, I'll name Carcarodon Carcarius. There we go. Cool. Okay. All right, so, um, and j just in case, like, I, I just kind of, like, went too goofy and mumbled a lot. Um, so, Linne Carl Linnaeus, who invented uh, our modern system of taxonomy, um, th this is his name associated with the white shark. So he is uh, the author of this species in terms of, like, he's the first person to properly classify and name the great white shark. Um, so that's why his name is next to this and the date is when he did that. Um, so it's really cool. Kind of like fun trivia. Uh, white shark is one of the oldest sharks ever named, which makes sense because it's like a humongous shark that is also coastal dwelling. So it's like something that, you know, hundreds of years ago people could run into and understand immediately like, oh, I know what that shark is. Like that's a very, di like easily, easy to identify <laughs> frightening shark so um, basking sharks i think are also um one of the oldest sharks ever named uh but we're, we'll go back to our buddy we're gonna go back to rise of Pernod on terra nova uh the atlantic sharp nose shark because i do want to i do want to kind of like comb through some sharp nose shark research um now the search is kind of long i guess we'll go back here um, and then just as, as some background, um, I'll just kind of breeze through. This is the Florida Museum of Natural History. Just a quick little profile about this guy. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see. Small slim shark. Uh, it's very, very, very common. This this photo is kind of weird because this might be a Caribbean sharp nose shark. This this photo is used a lot, but I, I don't. I think the species might be mixed up. Um, but this shark is really, really common. It reproduces extremely quickly. It grows really quickly. And um, in shark surveys on the American East Coast, um, it's kind of like the number one species caught. It's one of the most abundant, if not the most abundant shark um, on that coast. It's not very famous. Like people, like unless you fish or, um, or, or like a shark person, um, it's not really a shark that people talk about or people know. Um, you don't see these in the aquarium as, or in aquaria, as far as I know. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a shark, no shark in an aquarium, uh, which is interesting. I, I wonder why that would be because they're very easy to acquire. So I'm kind of curious if maybe they don't do well in captivity because um, there's much larger sharks that you see in aquaria all the time. So I don't know. They're very, very abundant. So um, let's see. Got. I, and I'm just breezing through this, just as kind of like giving a, a background. Um, and habitat. This shark commonly habits both warm, temperate, and tropical waters from the Bay of Fundy to the Yucatan. Has zero residence uh, off the shore of South Carolina, Florida, and Florida Keys. The species shows regular, regular or shore of two migrations. migrations. The Atlantic Shark Nurse Sharks are observed, observed, observed large sexually large sexually uh, to form, uh, form uh, large, uh, large sexually segregated during migration migrations. As winter approaches, the sharks often go offshore into deeper water and return short to mate in spring. In give birth after a 10 to 11 month gestation. So this is the craziest, craziest thing about, thing about species. this species. That is that very, very short, short for sharks. For sharks. And, and also, also they, 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 they reproduce yearly. yearly. Like, 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 like uh, uh, sharks, sharks. A lot of sharks lot of take sharks a break, take a break like, like they do. Like they do. Um, I think um, one of the most famous examples is dusky sharks, where they their gestation period is a year and a half. And then they take a year and a half long break, creating a total reproductive cycle of three years. But this shark, it can mate. 
I think relatively quickly or immediately. Um, after it uh, gives birth, it doesn't have a break, so it reproduces every year, making it very fecund, I guess is the word, and uh, very, uh, what's the word, resilient to fishing pressure. It's uh, doing really, really well. It's one of the best, um, or rather one of the, I don't know, I, I hate using the term fittest, but kind of in, you know, in this age of a lot of fishing, it's it's doing really, really well. Um, so this is a shark of least concern. Its population trend is increasing. Um, and I jumped over to the IUCN Red List, uh, which is a good little summary on, uh, or a good little starting point on the shark's conservation. But it's doing really, really well. Um, in lectures, like, uh, I like to talk about the shark a lot as far as, like, conservation kind of gets uh, depressing sometimes um, with a lot of shark species because a lot of sharks are not doing well overall. But this one is, uh, I'm not going to say a success story because it's surviving a lot of pressure, but it's, it's, it's fine. It's kind of like a... a a bunny or a squirrel or something it's 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 doing really well it's going to be here um for you know as long as we're here so um it's 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 you know we'll, we'll always have a world of sharks uh which is something that i like i'm, I'm kind of, i'm an optimistic person so um i like knowing that at least some sharks are doing okay so um what else do we got on this species da, 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 da. let's go back to florida museum Bum, 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 bum. Oh yeah, uh, this shark does tolerate estuaries, so it does tolerate lower salinity. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, where, where I'm from, it's I think up to 18 parts per thousand, probably 20 parts per thousand. So they are very common in the bay, um, but they don't go up too, too far. So um, let's see what else we got. Now, what's funny is, like, or not funny, but, like, sometimes when people run into this species, they have a hard time telling it apart from, like, juvenile, uh, like, like baby, um, like, sandbar sharks and stuff. But um, there are some features, like, this, this shark overall, I'm trying to find a good picture. Um, the shark overall is much slimmer. Um, it, you can see its dorsal fin origin is well behind the uh, pectoral, uh, pectoral fin, sorry about that. Um, usually, I, th I think, I forget if it's like older individuals or younger individuals, but they do have spots. Let me, let me look that up. Um, and then the anal fin placement is very weird on the shark, where the origin of the second dorsal fin is at the midpoint of the anal fin. So um, it's, kinda, it's kind of an odd shape, actually, um, compared to a lot of other shark species. And it has uh, proportionally really big eyes. So um, long, slim shark that um, I think the biggest giveaway when you see it in the east coast of the United States, uh, in Canada, um, is just the spots, uh, like long, slim shark with white spots. Um, I'm trying to find a good picture of that. Do, 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 do. These aren't good pictures, that, and, and the reason, part of the reason why I'm not seeing the spots in these pictures is, um, you know, these individuals are not doing so well. They're kind of maybe dead. Um, and that actually might be a totally different species. Well, spots. <laughs> there we go. Dorsal surface has white spots in adults. Okay. So the adults have the spots. Okay. Most adult specimens have white spots or splotches. Okay. Um, let's see if we can get that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a good... I do want to point this out because this this is something that really helps identify it. Oh, that was actually a good picture. Darn it. This one. There we go. Come on. Whoa, where are we? All right. So there's a spot. There's a spot. This is a unique feature uh, or unique. Well, uh, actually, yeah, no, a unique feature to the species. I can't think of any other carcharinids in this part of the world that has that coloration. Um, let's find another picture that might be better. There we go. Ooh, oh, and we're back to shark references. That's hilarious. Okay. So yeah, see these little spots, these white spots? That, that really helps, to, like, identify the species. If, if you're in the, the, um, east coast of the U.S. or Canada, um, that, that helps identify the species versus, 
other carcharinids. Um, and then also, yeah, the eyes, the eyes are proportionally really, really big. So, um, one interesting thing about sharks in general, let's see if I can get one more picture. Uh, that's actually pretty okay. As far as the spots go. Ooh, that's actually a beautiful photo. Oh, and it's back to shark references. All right. Shark references knows what it's doing. All right. We'll just stick with shark references that. Oh, by the way, uh, Andy Merck, a Lazo diver, fantastic shark photographer. He, he, he's one of the best in the world. So, uh, let's shout out to his website. Um, that's a really good picture. Uh, and that is, wow, actually. Okay. So why I'm kind of stuck on this picture is um this is a very fresh specimen he might still be alive in this photo but how you can tell is do you see you see this iridescence this beautiful rainbow pattern um that that is kind of like an indicator of um how do i say this like like when sharks are healthy or or just caught um and i, I think this goes for a lot of fish but for sharks um uh, especially is like you can tell like like their 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 skin is vibrant um and and like that iridescent sheen is something that you can see in a lot of different species and then uh when the animal's stressed or uh not doing so well the color fades um or or the color changes so um but the color the color can be an indicator of health or stress so that's part of why this photo is like striking me a little bit because i can see that iridescent sheen like see you can see that blue, pink, orange, pink, you know, on top of that color pattern. Um, and then, you know, the white spots, you can see that as well. So that's, a, that's actually a really beautiful photo. It's a little grainy, but that's actually a really beautiful photo of that, of that shark. So, um, let's see. It's a really cool tooth morphology. Damn, these are cool teeth. I love how they're like hooked backwards. That's really cool. So shout out to if uh, you ever want to use uh, shark photographs, like professional shark photographs, if you were like, um, I'm trying to think like, uh, you, you would have to purchase these uh, and they're well worth it. They're gorgeous, amazing photos. Um, and I, and I've worked with uh, Andy before, like, like th these are absolutely fantastic. Um, Elazva, Elazva Diver, uh, slash Andy Merck is amazing. Um, I also think he is Canadian or based out of Canada. Hold on. Let's see if we can find that. Yeah. Victoria, BC. Awesome. All right. All right. All right. So yeah, go Canada, man. I'm saying it. Go Canada. Cause it's like, <laughs> I forgot he was actually from Canada. So, and again, he's one of the best in the world. Like, look, look at these photos. Like, like, ooh, let's look at the scalp hammerhead really quick. Oh, God, look at these photos. So, so good. Actually, let's, let's focus on the sharp nose shark. Just to be, just to be nice. So, all right. I know, I know it's a little, um, the water's a little cloudy, but that's an environmental thing. That's not an Andy thing. Like, he's, he's, he's amazing. So, that's actually not a bad photo. And I'm actually, where is this from? Ooh, what happened? I got redirected. Dude, look at these, actually. These are gorgeous. That one's cool. I, I really like that other one. Oh man. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, yeah, I love all sharks, but the, these sharks, they, they do, they, I mean, all sharks have a special place in my heart, but, you know, this one's no exception. Like, uh, I've literally stared eye to eye with this with this species, so it's just like I don't know. I also love like shark eyes, especially you can see it with this this species. It sounds kind of dumb, but like they remind they really do remind me of like um, like Jurassic Park, like the raptors. Like like they really do remind me of those eyes, like these like brilliant, fierce, like powerful, shining. Not scary, but like there's an intensity to shark eyes that I, I think, and like like a complexity to them. Like this is not like an animal that's like, you know, blub. Like like it's it's not it's like it's not a passive animal. Like there's just like 
I don't know, there's like such an intensity or like I don't want to say a ferocity, but there's like there's like this furious energy like like behind those eyes. I I love sharks and I love I love shark eyes. So um let's see. Do, 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 do. Yep, the species is Hess's least concern because of its abundance and life history characteristics, which make it less susceptible to removals than many other species of sharks. So I guess well we got this I think this is an automatic slideshow, is it? It is. Okay. I think we've got this automatic slideshow going. I might read the official uh, description of Shark No Sharks. So, uh, from The Great Tome. I just need a sip of my uh, uh, cocoa. Hmm. And water. <laughs> All right. Woo. Um. Where are you? So also, uh, Howard, I'm, I, it's kind of coming to me like, I'm wondering if we should do a Hexantius next week, maybe, I'm kind of, or not next week, sorry, the week after the holidays. So um, I'm thinking about that now, like, like, uh, kind of like, I kind of like the idea of like a fossil living fossil theme, maybe, uh, like with one of the six gill or seven gill sharks, that might be kind of a cool idea. I don't know. Uh, but but let me know what you think, because... Alright, here we go. Rise of Priondon Terranovi. Um, do, 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 do. And actually, I might, I might read the identification, because I know I, I did, like, a general overview, but there's not a lot on this shark in this book, so I just might go through the identification for it. So, Atlantic Shark No Shark... Rhizoprionodon terranovi. Very similar to Rhizoprionodon porosus, small bodied, long snout, long upper labial furrows, fairly large eyes, first dorsal fin origin usually over or slightly in front of pectoral fin free rear tips, no interdorsal ridge, small second dorsal fin origin over anal fin mid base inserts. And you know what? Now I'm reading this, like, I kind of covered that, so I don't know. Gray to gray brown above with small light spots on sides of large specimens. Okay, yeah. Oh, here we go. Pectoral fins with white margins. I kind of missed that part. So, oh, and actually you can see that in the photo, can't you? Look at that. So the pectoral fins have these beautiful, like, white margins. Um, that's awesome. Okay. I totally missed that part. Um, dorsals with dusky tips. Uh, white below. I don't know if I'm seeing that on the dorsal fins. I think... I think the dusky tips are a juvenile characteristic because these guys look kind of for, for this species these guys look well i don't know they look fairly big to me for the for the species because this is a small shark in general um not even a meter long so like or where the max size can be um 113 centimeters so like 1.1 meters but for the most part, this is like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 meters, so it's it's a small guy. This is one of, one. Of, it's a small. I don't want to call it a cute shark, but it's it's a small shark. Excuse me. Um, let's see. Lives in coastal and enclosed bays, uh, sounds, harbors, and marine to brackish estuaries from intertidal to 280 meters, usually less than 10 meters. Often close to surf zone, off sandy beaches. Uh, let's see. Uh, viviparous yolk sac placenta, one to seven pups per litter, usually four to six, increasing with female size, born inshore in spring and summer after 10 to 11 month uh, gestation. Uh, age of maturity is 2.4 to 3.9 years, maximum age 10 years. Um, feeds mainly on small bony fishes. It's abundant and able to sustain fairly intensive fishing pressure. So, yeah, that's all, that's all, that's all this book has on this shark. Um... I think we have, 
I think Sharks of the Gulf of Maine, or Fishes of the Gulf of Maine, has something on the sharks. So I might pull that really quickly. Um, yeah, let me let me. Let me see if I can grab something from that. One moment. Let's see. Let's see. Cause I'm I'm kind of curious. I'm pretty sure I got something. Let's see. Whoa. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, this has appeared, I think, just once before on the stream. This is Fishes of the Gulf of Maine by Bigelow and Schroeder. This is one of the most famous fisheries biologist books in the world. Uh, or, I shouldn't say in the world. But, like, just, this is really important. If you love fish and shark science, um, this is a really good one to get. Um, so, and I'm pretty sure there was a little bit of something... Um, but, like I talked about in one of the earlier streams, something that I personally love about this book is, like, it gets a little bit more, um, like, it's science, but uh, the authors are, it, it's an older book. Like, the, 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 the book originally was published in the 50s, and it's been revised a lot. Um, I think this edition is 2006. But anyway, um, sometimes it can get a little prosaic, which is a lot of fun. So, it's something I really like about this book. So, oh, here we go. Let's go Atlantic Sharpness Shark. Let's see if we can get something interesting. Well, this sonic music is great. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I didn't, I didn't think I would enjoy Sonic the Hedgehog Chill Hop. But that's or lo-fi, sorry, lo-fi. But it's pretty good. It's really nice. Very relaxing. <laughs> the all tackle game record is a seven point two five kilogram fish caught in Port Mansfield, Texas. That is what, the size of a a fat chihuahua? Uh that's a, it's a small shark. So <laughs> Um, let's see. Yep. Hmm. Likes to eat smallmouth flounder, uh, herring, anchovy, pipefish, sea robin, uh, stargazer. That's interesting. So, I don't know if you guys have heard of stargazers, but these are kind of like um, squashy little fish that, or not, eh, small fish, a squashy small fish that bury themselves in the, stand, in the sand. Their eyes are on the top of their head, hence the name stargazer, and they actually are able to produce electricity. Like, they actually can shock you in the way that, um, I think it is like the way that electric rays can shock you. So um, stargazers are not well known uh, as far as like um, pop culture or like the people don't know what stargazers are usually, but they're here. Uh, they, I know that we have one, we definitely have one in Virginia um, or maybe two. We definitely have one. We definitely have one, the Northern Stargazer in Virginia. But there's a Southern Stargazer, a couple others, uh, all along the coast here. So I'm curious where else you might find Stargazers. But they're a really cool fish. Uh, I, I think it's funny that the shark eats them. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can pull up a picture of one in a bit. Actually, yeah, let me pull up a picture of one. Speaking of random. Stargazer. No, it's not a song. It's a fish. Yes, actually, that's a terrifying picture of one. But yeah, that's what it is. That's a terrifying picture of one. Okay. So this is what a stargazer looks like. <laughs> oh, man. That's a really terrifying picture, actually. 
So this is this is a real legitimate fish. Um, that's a really scary picture. But see these little indentations uh, kind of behind the eyes? Those are electric producing organs uh, uh, or organs that generate uh, kind of like an electric shock. So if you step on one or you touch one, um, you, you will get shocked. And I forget kind of specifically how they work, but um, creepy fish, I will take the picture away. But I think it's really funny that the shark eats this. Like, like that's actually really funny. So uh, pretty interesting. One thing that's fun about um, shark science in general, or like just kind of marine science in general, is that um, you might be focusing on one group, but you often intersect with multiple different species. Like, I don't work with stargazers, so this is not a stargazer stream, but you know, it came up. So I, I, I just think that stuff is fun. So uh, what else we got? Filefish and puffers. Oh. Uh, it's also eats crabs, shrimp, and stomatopods, squids, and gastropods. Males and females mature in about three to four years. That's wild. These guys are doing really, really well. There was an interesting study. I might have talked about this before, but um, I think it was in the Indian Ocean, and uh, it was like a coral reef study where they studied large sharks um, slowly being like removed from the habitat due to fishing. And they noticed that smaller sharks, kind of like sharp nose sharks, um, or you know, sharks that kind of fit into the same category as sharp nose sharks, um, were replacing their niche. So like if a big shark, like a tiger shark, is removed from a specific area, that there's it kind of leaves a vacuum of opportunity that smaller sharks swoop in and take like they kind of take the the place or, or take the niche of that larger shark is it, so that study like was like saying um i forget specifically what it was um we might be able to find it i don't think it was about sharp nose sharks specifically but uh, we'll come through the uh the uh, shark references.com just to see if if it's there but i always thought that was really interesting um that's one of the many reasons why i do think this shark is going to be perfectly fine um you know just just again like i know conservation can be doom and gloom and depressing um and, and validly so in a lot of ways but you know sharks like this are nice to talk about in terms of like they're okay you know then they're, they're gonna be okay so like they're very very successful uh but anyway uh yeah three to four years that's a really quick turnaround time like in terms, as far as reproduction or maturity goes like like the shark group uh, matures in three to four years it's pretty wild um, the species gives birth each year, unlike many carcharinids, which have a resting stage in a reproductive cycle. So I talked about that earlier, but that's also a huge part of this species. Um, let's see. Mating occurs in late June, and the gestation period lasts about 11 months. Litters of four to six young are born at about 35 centimeters. And 200 grams in May. Oh, it's really small. Um, let's see. As they disappear from coastal waters at this time, females may seek tidal creeks and bays to give birth. Interesting. Atlantic sharp nose sharks are probably the most common coastal shark in the southeastern United States. They are replaced in the Caribbean by a similar species, Rhizoperonodon porosus, from which it could be distinguished by vertebral counts. Oh, okay. So, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is a common shark taken by recreational fishermen in the southeastern United States and often eaten. Oh. Although taken in large numbers as bycatch of various commercial fisheries, they are not often sold because of their small size. So. It's a powerhouse. I mean, it's it's doing really well. So it's it's not not in as grave danger as a lot of other shark species. But anyway, uh, vertebral counts. So uh, there's famous examples of sharks that were once considered to be one species, but then after closer examination. The re the, there was a realization that like oh this is a different species there's a subtle physical difference in in the case of this shark like vertebral counts um 
but it also like you know the, like genetically um this po the the populations are not mixing like the shark with like five vertebrae is not mating with the shark with six vertebrae you know those are actually different species that don't mate um even though they look almost exactly the same it's just the vertebral count is different so um i did i forgot that shark that this species um had that kind of what's the word delineation um but famously the carolina hammerhead was separated from the scalloped hammerhead so it's Sphirna Gilberti or Gilberti versus Sphirna Luini for the same reason. Um, so this shark, uh, Rhizoprion terranovi versus Rhizoprion on porosis. And then I want to say we talked about this like three streams ago, but like Squalus acanthias versus Squalus succlii, I think, or is it the populations don't mix? I kind of forget actually, which is really bad. But anyway. But vertebral counts sometimes have been a way to determine different species. Um, so I thought it was interesting. I forgot that that was something that was going on um, for the classification of this shark. So that's pretty cool. Um, oh, let's go into... Let's see if we can get a habitat. I'll close that out because I don't want to crash my internet. Um, let's see if we can get a habitat study on this species. There we go. I forget what Rise of Prandon means, but Terra Novi means new world. So it's Rise of Prandon of the new world. I forget what that word means though. Uh, Sorry, I'm just kind of curious if they have etymology. Sometimes Florida Museum... It... Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go, here we go. Genus name Rhizoprion is derived from the Greek Rhiza root, prion, saw, and aduus, teeth. Uh, oduus? All right, teeth. So saw root tooth, or root saw tooth, okay? Terra Nova is Latin language meaning new land. Okay, new land, terra, that makes sense. But, you know, so it's the... Saw root tooth of the new world. Interesting. Okay. All right, here we go. Hmm. Oh, what a title. It's a shark eat shark world, but does that make for bigger pups? A comparison between oophagus and non oophagus viviparous sharks. Uh, it's the holidays, I'm not in the mood for that, but, um, that's a cool title, though. That's, you know. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Let's see if we can get this one. That sounds interesting. Oh, I'm downloading it. Okay. All right. So I guess we're getting the whole thing. Evaluation of shifts in the potential future distributions of carcharinid sharks under different climate change scenarios. That sounds interesting. Uh, hold on. Show and finder. My, my computer is a little weird because I can't open PDFs directly. Hold on. Open with preview. Okay. Okay, there we go. Uh, climate change is currently considered one of the main phenomena affecting marine species through expansion or contraction of the distribution. Being ectothermic organisms, sharks of the family Carcharanidae could be highly susceptible to the effects of climate change. These sharks are of great ecological importance, which is reflected in their role in the integrity of coastal and oceanic ecosystems as top predators that act to maintain the stability of the food chain. Yes, and as well as providing economic value through fishing consumption and e ecotourism. Currently, the populations are threatened by fishing pressure and anthropogenic activities, including meeting the demand for shark fins. Um, despite the ecological, also anthropogenic means us like humans. Um, despite the ecological and economical importance of carcharanid sharks, knowledge regarding how they are impacted by climate change remains scarce, which is true. Yeah, there's not a lot of climate studies on sharks 
Um, ecological niche modeling. Ooh, oh my god, this might be it. Ecological niche modeling is a tool that allows analysis of future potential distributions under different climate change scenarios and could contribute to future planning activities and improve conservation outcomes for sharks. We generated models in Maxent, oh boy, in order to predict the potential geographic distribution of 25 carcarinid sharks that inhabit Mexican waters, projecting this onto future climate change scenarios. Uh, before I continue, sorry, I have to, I have to shout out, sorry about that. Uh, Pedro Luis Diaz Carbalito, uh, Gabriela Mendoza Gonzalez, uh, she sounds familiar actually, Carlos Alberto Yanez Arenas, and Xavier Chiapa Carrera. So this is evaluation of shifts in the potential future uh, distributions of carcarated sharks under different climate change scenarios. Sorry about that. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, to calculate the potential losses and gains in their distribution areas by the year of 2050. The greatest shifts in suitable areas were observed for the sharks Trinodon obesus, gained area, so this is the white tip reef shark, and Carcharhinus porosus, lost area. That, no, what is that one? Carcharhinus peronis, porosus. Why am I blanking on that? I should know that. Carcharhinus porosus. Why am I blanking on that one? What is that? It's small tail shark, right? Small tail shark. That's a small tail shark. Sorry, that threw me off for a little bit. Carcharhinus porosus is a small tail shark, right? Hello. Oh boy. Come on. Oh, there you go, there you go. Yep, small tail shark. Okay. Sorry, that really threw me off. Um, so small tail shark is not a very popular shark. Um, it's not a very well-known shark. Where did it go? Okay. Um, okay, lost area. It's not a very well-known shark, um, but that really threw me off because I know, I know it lives in my backyard <laughs> and, like, kind of... I forgot. I knew I should have known what that was. Anyway, overall, under all four RCP future scenarios, six species presented gains in suitable area, and 19 species presented losses. I'm going to guess, based on everything we talked about so far, that Rise of Prionodon Terra Novi, our lovely sharp nose shark, gains. I'm going to predict that he is doing fine and he's going to gain. So here we go. The greatest loss of suitable area for carcarinid sharks was found with blah. Uh, however, under this high emission global warming scenario, seven species actually showed an increase in distribution area. Our results therefore indicate that climate change could reduce suitable areas for most of the species by 2050. Assessment of the distribution of shark species under climate change is urgently required in order to prioritize conservation efforts towards the most vulnerable species and to ensure the natural function of marine ecosystems, thus, thus maintaining the important ecosystem services they provide to human society. So, um, on that note, by the way, I mean, that is fine. I, I just, uh, I kind of, I'm kind of like a, I don't want to say like I'm a hippie, but like I'm, I'm I definitely kind of have more like, they have a right to live sort of vibe, you know, in terms of like, when we talk about climate change or shark existential threat. I mean, you know, and like, like used to human society, that's totally fine. That is totally fine as an argument. I just, I just like, you know, I like talking about like, they have a right to live. They have a right to be themselves. I don't know. I just, it's kind of new agey and like hippie ish, but like, I don't know. That's, that's, I just, I just wanted to take a moment to say that, you know, just sharks have a right to live. All right. Let's see. <laughs> oh gosh okay well now we gotta interpret this okay initial number of occurrences the number after filtering and those used to conduct the calibration and the evaluation process so here's our shark rise of a rise of prion on terra novi 891 versus 118 so does that mean he did worse and didn't gain I don't know. I'm um, just breezing through this. Uh, 
I'm gonna control find if I don't know what I'm doing. Here we go. Just zooming in. Oh. Well, that's interesting. My guess is not correct. So if I'm reading this correctly, here's the range maps for, um, like under these scenarios, this is all like scenarios or theory, but like under these maps, under these scenarios, you have um, our shark, Rise of Proud and Terra Novi. The purple area is loss. The yellow areas maintain, and the green areas gain. So there's tiny areas of gain under these climate change scenarios, but for the most part, this shark lost areas, which is surprising to me because everything we talked about where it's like... But actually, everything we talked about is in the context of fishing pressure, not necessarily global warming. So, I don't know. I'm literally thinking out loud by not, right now in terms of like... Why this might be the case. Let's see who's gaining. So, Carcharhinus perezi, this is the Caribbean shark, uh, Caribbean reef shark, would be gaining under these scenarios. Carcharhinus acronotus, the black nose shark, would be gaining. Carcharhinus isodon, the fine tooth shark, would be gaining. What? I don't know. I, I, although, I don't know too much about the biology of that species. I'm just kind of surprised that. Huh. These are sharks I'm not as familiar with, but they look like they're gaining. This is a different rise of Prionodon. Oh, this is Nasolamia. I forget exactly what Nasolamia is, but I know that name. Huh. Oh, uh, the bull shark, Carcranus lucas. What's going on there? Gaining in New Zealand, maintaining everywhere else. This is a very interesting study. Oh. Cochrane is Signatus, the night shark. Right? Yeah, that's the night shark. Wow. Gaining. Losing and gaining. This is very interesting. Negaprion barbarostris, lemon shark, gaining, losing. Very interesting. Whoa, look at these. Okay, I see what they're saying. Trying to obesis, the white tip reef shark gaining in these green areas. Carcharis plumbius, sandbar shark gaining for the most part. Carcharis obscurus losing. Carcharis alba marginatus is a silver tip shark gaining. Carcharis altimus big nose shark, I think, kind of a mix. This is a really interesting study. I've never seen this before. This is super cool, actually. Hmm. Oops, sorry. I uh, didn't mean to do that. Carcharis lumbatus. This is a black tip shark, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gaining and then losing in the Indo Pacific. The question I would have, though, is. Is this taken? In, it's not taken into account fishing pressure, right? This is just temperature. All, all this stuff is just speculating what's going on with temperature, right? And that's that's an open question. I don't know. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just, uh, but that's just a question that I kind of like I'm thinking about now. Carcharis longomanus. This is the oceanic white tip shark, which is actually critically endangered and doing very poorly, gaining theoretically. Okay, let's figure this out. Uh, let's go ahead and do a control find. What's going on? Why is the shark mesh shark not doing well on this stuff? Okay, can't find that, right? Oh, there we go. Okay, so here we go. Uh, for instance, wait, hold, hold on. This could be, be, wait, hold on, hold on. 
Regarding the losses and gains of suitable area found for carcharidid sharks, the relationship between species niche properties as indicators of species sensitivity and climate change have been proved, as well as some hypotheses regarding which species will be more sensitive. For example, uh, Rosa et al. indicated that the more active pelagic sharks would experience greater negative physiological impacts from increasing ocean temperatures than their benthic counterparts. This could be because more active pelagic lifestyles correlate with higher metabolic rates, which are temperature dependent compared to those of the less active benthic or bathial species. For instance, we found percentages of suitable area loss for Rhizoprionodon terra novi, an obligate ram ventilator that must move by swimming at a speed, at speed, or finding a swift current in which to linger in order to continually force water through its gills to breathe. And for Carcharinus isodon, which is described as an active shark. So that's really interesting, because now that I'm thinking about it, I've never seen the shark in aquariums, and like, I mean, you, you can have, no, actually, no, wait, hold on. Okay, so, so obligate ram ventilator means, um, I mean, they just described it, but it has to keep swimming in order to breathe. Not all sharks are like this, but quite a few are, but... Sandbar sharks are ram ventilators. I've seen them in aquariums. Uh, I've seen bonnet heads in aquariums, and they're ram ventilators. So, I don't know. Okay, so never mind. Scratch that. Uh, yeah, scratch that. Um, I'm just kind of surprised, because this shark has a pretty large range, like a large temperature range, too, because you can find this species, I think you can actually get see him all the way up in Canada. Let's check that out. Right? Yeah. So you can find the shark all the way up to Nova Scotia. Let's check that out with fishes of Gulf of Maine. Meaning, like, he has a pretty... I mean, I know we're talking about global warming, but this is like a... You know, this is a shark that lives in, like, tropical, warm-temperate, cold-temperate, and just, like, I mean, like, I mean, like that's a pretty big range. range. So, uh, so I don't, it, 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 it's, it's surprising, surprising it's that it's described as sensitive. It's like, it's like, I mean, I don't know. I know. Parsons and Huffmeyer. Seasonal changes in distribution relative abundance of the Atlantic sharpest shark, rising prone in Terra Novi in the north central Gulf of Mexico. Ooh, that'd be kind of interesting. I'm gonna copy that. I just realized it's like it's not close to 11, but almost sort of closest to 11, so I will wrap this up in a little bit. Happy holidays, y'all. Um, let's see. I, I won't read this out loud. I'm just skimming through this. But uh, seasonal changes in distribution and relative abundance of the Atlantic sharpnose shark, Rhizoprion on Terra Novi, in the north central Gulf of Mexico, by Glenn R. Parsons and Eric R. Hoffmeyer. Oh, we also found a significant effect uh, of season on condition factor of adult males with shark condition lowest during summer months. Okay, 
These results suggest that the exodus of adult males from inshore waters may be in response to high temperature, low oxygen conditions of summer. That's interesting. Um, however, reproductively motivated migration from Mississippi Sound is likewise a possibility. This is really interesting. This is super, super interesting. That's what science is all about. Like, like you can kind of follow a paper trail and find things and correlate observations and you know you can make challenges and see how far you can get with them it's re it's really interesting okay so this might be i did not know that this might be a temperature sensitive shark that's really interesting okay let's go back to that study i don't think there's anything else on this i'm going to search for the common name Yeah, haha, <laughs> shark, shark, shark. Uh, I want Atlantic sharp nose. Let's just do sharp nose. Uh, okay, alright, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting. So, this guy might be temperature s sensitive. So, oh, it's Hornby Island. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. You know what? I, sh I should not have closed that. Hold on. I want to see what the discussion is. Um, Show and find her. And then, and then I'll, I'll call it a night. So. Okay, conclusion. Our results show the usefulness of correlative models based on the ecological niche theory in terms of modeling the future potential distribution of cockroach and sharks through presence records and environmental variables. We conclude that the climate change will have an important effects on the distribution of cockroach and sharks by the year 2050, highlighting losses of suitable area for most species. The cockroach and sharks presented the, great, the greatest loss of suitable area under the severe future climate scenario, RCP 8.5. Uh, the shark species with the greatest loss of suitable area was C. porosus. And shark species of highest gain suitable areas, T. obesus. Species distribution modeling approaches, such as that utilized in the study, represent an attempt to identify changes in the distribution pattern of carcarinid sharks and can provide basic primary information of potential value to the improvement of decision making processes in biodiversity conservation. So, that part is the most important in terms of like, these, the, the, this is um, a framework for management or a framework for conservation plans or conservation action. This is not guaranteeing all these scenarios are gonna happen, but this is a good guess in turn, or I, I, I shouldn't say good guess because I, I don't know, I didn't read the whole paper. Um, and please leave a comment if you, if you do read the whole paper and if you're a climate scientist or a climatologist, uh, especially with like conservation or marine, marine conservation and marine uh, ecology and if what you thought about this study so um, but anyway um, so I don't know how accurate that model is um, but either way the model is not a guarantee of what's going to happen in the future it's just a framework for conservation action that may benefit or uh, prohibit or not pro prohibit but like may benefit these sharks and may um, help them in the face of potential like 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 scenarios reaching to that potential point. So um, the preservation of sharks is a key element in the present and future is important to the maintenance of ecosystem services of great value to the human society, as well as to conserve the natural function of the marine ecosystems. I like the latter part the most. So, um, so that is interesting. Uh, I think my biggest takeaway personally from this is uh, learning that Atlantic sharp nose sharks might be temperature sensitive um, or more temperature sensitive than I had originally thought. So. So I just wanted to take a look at the conclusion really quickly to see if there's anything else on that. So again, uh, evaluation of shifts in the potential future distributions of carcarine sharks under different climate change scenarios. Uh, again, if you're a climate person or a uh, marine ecologist uh, interested in climate change, um, let me know what you think about this study because like, I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with this. And uh, either way, um, my only takeaway or my biggest takeaway is sharp nose sharks might be temperature sensitive, which is something I never heard of before. And um, that, that makes sense. I just, uh, I just never, I, I just, I learned something today. So 
Which is the point. <laughs> but anyway, I think that might be all I have. Um, but let's end on Shark Fawn of um, Hornby Island, British Columbia. And I don't know, Howard, if you're still here. Uh, if you are, any thoughts on next week's shark? Because I think in the meantime, I might make a pick. And then also, if you have, if you or anybody else has music suggestions, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, um, I would happily take those as well. It's going to be the new year, so I don't know if there's going to be a theme with that, but let's see. Corpolite's bones of evidence of shark predation. Just Grisius. I don't know if we should do. We might. I don't know. I don't know if Howard's here now. So I might have to pick. I'm not 100% committed to this yet. I will leave. I will leave opportunity in the chat. But, but, but. Um, we might do uh, six skill sharks uh, when I come back. So um, on that note, guys, uh, I'm going to call it a night and I'm going to call it a 2022. Um, and just taking a couple of minutes to talk about the live stream project. Uh, it's only been uh, a couple weeks now, um, or I guess like a little over a month, you know, but I'm loving this. Like this is super fun. And um, I've already met some really cool people through this. So you guys are awesome. And go Canada. Canada is great. <laughs> like, um, I really appreciate the, 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 the US Canadian relations are, are strong. You know, like this, this is really, really cool. Um, being able to talk to, to you guys and to hear your suggestions. And I love your comments and I love um, your participation in the chat. It is super, super fun. Um, to go back and forth and and to learn things because it's like I would never have gone in like um, Snaggletooth shark uh, last week or some of the fossil sharks that we talked about today Never have gone that uh, direct a direction without you guys So I really appreciate uh, you interacting and just like the feedback and it's it's super cool. So um, Currently, I guess maybe we could do this every year um Currently, the channel is microscopic, which is fine, <laughs> but like, I think we have 150 subs, very, very tiny, very, very microscopic, which is fine. You know, I, it's, it's cool. Um, but I think I want to keep a metric of it because it's the end of the year. It's the last stream of 2022. So we currently have 150 subs. We've talked about seven sharks. We have two countries and a lot of fun. Like I'm really really enjoying this and i'm just really glad that we're all doing this now so um yeah but i hope you guys have a happy holiday i will not be here next monday uh because i'll be visiting family but i am coming back for the new year and we are going to do a new shark so uh please let me know in the comments what your pick is otherwise i'll pick and please let me know your music suggestions uh, otherwise i will pick two uh preferably study music and not Dragon Force or something, because that's going to be too loud. Uh, but anyway, uh, happy holidays, guys, and I will see you soon. I will see you in the new year. Uh...